Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I hope you all have been enjoying the event, and I hope you're all excited about what we've announced so far uh, all through the event. And all these announcements are actually a manifestation of our commitment to security in the cloud. Today, and we're going to be talking about how you can use machine learning um, to automate code analysis um, from IDE all the way to production. And this is tied to one of the announcements we made yesterday uh, relating to code growth security, which basically uses ML to look at code analysis from a different perspective. We, we took a different approach as a machine learning team on how we want to approach this um, code analysis problem. And this presentation is going to walk you through what we've, what we've seen and what we've done on that side. Um, how we want to bring value to you and improve your code security analysis all through the ID CI CD pipeline. I have with me here Jazz Chabra, our engineering manager, and Omar, our machine learning, lead machine learning scientist for this presentation. I'll start with a poll just to get the conversation going. Um, please bring out your phones and just um, let's see what you have to say about what we have here. Okay, we'll go to results now. Instructions, yeah, this is typically what we see um, across most of our, this is typically what we see most times when we talk to customers. And we're gonna go through how we solve some of these problems and how we look at some other ones that we have, that has come up severely, more recently, has become a trend in the code security space. So, so today we're gonna to look at, you know, what customers are telling us today, um, the true impact of false positives, uh, which is a space that is becoming a lot more frequent today uh, as code bases have grown bigger. Um, how Amazon Code Security, code, code Guru Security looks at code security analysis, um, integrations that we currently all support, and then how we use ML and automated reasoning, and how you can get started today. So when we talk to customers, I'm sure you all know at Amazon, we take a different approach to product development, right? And that is that we always start by talking with customers and then we walk backwards from what the customer experience is and what we think, what customers want to act, it to actually be. So most customers we talk to have a DevSecOps workflow that looks kind of like this. There are different gating mechanisms that customers have for code security scanning. You know, some scan early in the CICD, some scan um, early in, uh, in the IDE, some scan closer during commit, and the rest, you know, you see different stages of the pipeline. But what we continuously see with customers is that irrespective of, in many cases, irrespective of what they, where they have their tooling, somehow, some way, vulnerabilities still make it to production. And this is something that we see re repeatedly with customers. And then in the course of our investigation, product discovery, and, you know, deep diving with customers, right? We started seeing the recurring themes around code security initiatives. What customers continue to say is that despite the investments they make in code security, they're not seeing the returns, they're not seeing a reduction in the amount of code vulnerabilities they see in production and an overall improvement in security posture across the organization. It's not translating dollar for, dollar for impact. And it comes across different stages of the life cycle of a, a vulnerability. The first thing that happens is that customers say that, tell us that when they're trying to roll out across the organization, it's a pain point for them. So many companies today have grown, organizations have grown by acquisition. So you see a company that acquired another company, um, organizations that have merged, and what you see is that different organizations had different native tooling solutions that use different platforms. So for the central centralized security team to develop that centralized view, of all the organizations that, that are now under the same umbrella is kind of a challenge. So rolling out security initiatives across larger organizations that, are, that have grown by acquisition or even grown just organically using different tools, some free, some paid, is a challenge for customers. And we're gonna go through how we designed our code group security differently to mitigate this problem. The second problem that customers always complain about, which is the one that we, we have looked at and seen the impact, and are tackling very decisively with machine learning. And it did feature on that question, right? It's the problem of false positives. What customers keep telling us is that, particularly on code vulnerabilities, the problem of false positives is a persistent one and a growing one. So when they're triaging these findings, they find a lot of false positives. And then as usual, developers want to build tools and ship, right? Developers want to meet their deadlines, meet feature launches. So putting these vulnerabilities back on the backlog 
for developers to work on is also a challenge, right? Because it's kind of like a comp competition between pushing out tools with uh, very agile or stepping back to fix vulnerabilities from um, code fixes that have been identified during you know, code scans. So this one, remediating the vulnerabilities that have been identified is also a challenge that customers face. And then lastly, but not the least, um, last but not the least, closure. Tracking vulnerabilities is also a challenge for customers. In some cases, um, tickets have to be open, tickets have to chase down, you know, and it's, it's customer, literally people spend time just trying to make sure that what they have on their dashboards is representative of what they actually have in their code base. The closed ones have been reflected and things like that. So customers keep complaining to us about this thing. And while customers are struggling to juggle these different challenges, right, bad actors are not sleeping, right? Between 2019 and 2021, a report showed that zero-day vulnerabilities doubled, zero-day zero exploits doubled the infrequency, right? And while this is happening, right, teams are, are finding that the bad actors are getting better at, at doing what they do, but their teams are not becoming more agile in combating this situation. And it's been a big concern for customers, right? And the recurring theme in, code, in the code security space is, right, is that false positives are one of the big reasons why customers are not seeing progress the way they want to see, particularly on code analysis. And customers always tell us that they spend more time investigating, they spend a lot of valuable time investigating false positives. So we, as a machine learning team, AI machine learning team, with a fresh pair of eyes, approach this problem, you know, and the question we ask ourselves is, why is it that this problem is becoming a growing trend, becoming a more repetitive concern? A few years back, it wasn't really the top, not top pain, but we're seeing it steadily becoming a growing concern in crude analysis, false positives, false positives. And the way that I like to um, explain it to customers, the way we, the way we kind of take the message back to customers and say, this is why it's actually a problem, and this is what we're doing. It's best exemplified through this poll that I'm going to put now. And I don't, no one, um, I don't expect you to laugh, but it's a funny poll. But please bring out your phones, and um, I want to see you vote on this question. Uh, I'll give a few minutes for the results to come in, for the polls to be submitted and the results to come in. Let's see what um, results say. Interesting. Everyone thinks it's a cat. Interesting. Okay. 82% say it's a cat, 20, 18, and 20% say it's not. Okay, that's a good one. Let's go back to the presentation. <laughs> so I hate to break the news to you. It's not a cat. And I always do this when I hear, when people say it's a cat, I say it's not a cat. When people say it's not a cat, I say it's a cat. So what, I, what we did here is we constrained the options you have to answer this question, to binary options. You either say yes or no. You know? But let's take it to real life and explore the... Um, what we should, what, what most things in life look like. So, let's think. Um, if you think it's still a cat, raise your hand. <laughs> I see two hands behind. Um, I, I once did a presentation where someone said, "Yeah, this is, this is a cat that my my, my six year old daughter would love." And then let's see what the answer looks like if we give context. If you think it's a cat, raise your hand now. Way more hands. The difference between the poll and this second um, set of questions that I ask now is something called context. Code analysis has a lot of, is this a cat situations? A method you use a certain way could be a vulnerability. And when you use the same method in a different way, and Omar, our machine learning scientist, is going to show you an example of that, it's not a vulnerability. If you are simply trying to identify methods by, I see you, I call you a cat, you will have a lot of false positives because you need context on how the code is working with that method. And this is the reason why customers are complaining of false positive context. And we in the machine learning team believe that we have the tools and technology to build that context to say, this is a cat or this is not a cat. So why is code analysis inherently challenging and causing so much pain for our customers today? Right? Context is everything, right? A function can be vulnerable in one way and not vulnerable in another way. And if the person or the people voting, in this case the algorithm, is unable to get the context required, is it a, a, a parent asking or is it a zoologist asking, you're likely going to have that split of 
it, it goes either way. Most times I, when I ask this, I get it, it, it always swings. I think most people here are probably scientific, so everyone is kind of thinking towards the scientific um, taxonomy, taxonomic explanation of what the cat is. But it swings either way when I do. I, I, I never get consistent answers. And that's exactly what the issue of false positives is about. One tool could call something a, a, a vulnerability and another one because it depends on how context is processed. So that's, this is one of the inherent reasons why code, code scanning is challenging. The second reason is that engineers code differently. So if I were to ask everyone here to write um, a function that basically just um, picks up data from uh, an API, dumps it in JSON string, JSON, everyone here would write it differently. But the code blocks that you write for that will meet the requirements. Different people write code differently. So if you're trying to do basic pattern matching to find vulnerabilities, you're going to pat pattern match one million different ways of right of killing, skinning, it, 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 you know, doing the same objective, achieving the same objective. So you just can't rely on one-to-one -one analysis. You kind of have to be more intelligent, more nuanced in looking at it because every engineer writes code differently. Another reason why this happens is that code is fluid. So when we started talking to customers about this, um, one thing customers came up with is that customers said, um, when we're trying to fix vulnerabilities, um, sometimes we lose track of whether a bug is open or not because when the pull request, when the um, ticket is made and, and we, we, the pull request is submitted, we see that the engineer fixed something else and the, the um, vulnerability has moved from where it was to another one and some, somehow the algorithms lose, lose track. And we, we went back to the lab with this request and built the ability, which we're going to explain down the line, to actually pick a code, um, a code block, see on the first revision the, code, uh, the vulnerability was on line 10, and the next revision, when it was submitted, it's moved to line 50 because some new features have been added or some other fix has happened and still not lose track of that vulnerability. The age remains the same. It's that same one we saw on 10 last time that is now on 50. The algorithm is, has that, um, um, is stateful in that way. So we can see it and leave the vulnerability open and not close it and open a new one and then mess up the, uh, um, the, the statistics on bug generation rate and bug closure rate. So the, we can actually see that it's the same bug. A very it's, it's, it looks easy, but it was actually a very um, nuanced and very advanced feature that we actually worked on using machine learning. So that's, the, that's one of the issues that we find in this code analysis space that customers complained about in being able to track and close vulnerabilities. And the last one, coding techniques are always evolve, const constantly evolving. Um, companies are continuously leveraging technology to scale their reach, to scale their efficiency. More, more uh, workflows are being automated with technology. So we're seeing that companies' that techniques are evolving every day to make code, coding more efficient. And a method that was considered um, safe today, over time, as um, sometimes bad actors become more sophisticated, hardware becomes more um, sophisticated, can actually be classified by CWEs and the, the security organizations as now being considered to be vulnerable. So when, with, that, that, with that being the case, you know, we keep seeing that this is another issue why, and that problem that customers face with code analysis, keeping up with the pace at which coding techniques evolve. But outside this, something that we saw as we step back to look at this space to understand why is this trend growing and why is this complaint coming more often? is the issue of the growth of code bases. So over the last years, a few, over the last decade, one of the biggest um, repository um, platforms published the size of code bases across their repositories. And the growth was, was significant. What happened is not that um, the tools that are available, um, maybe like what we've been using for code scanning, um, deteriorated in quality, no. What happened is simply that code bases grew bigger and the same algorithm with a 30% false positive rate on a few lines of code was manageable for a team of one or two security engineers. But this company has now scaled their engineering team because they've seen the benefit of automating, you know, of leveraging new technology in everything they do. And now their code base is 10x. So that same n less than 10 number of findings is now n times 10. And then the teams come, they come to us and say, we're drowning in false positives. That's basically what happened over, over these years. And because of this, we, when we talk with customers to better understand, okay, how is this change? How is this issue that you're reporting to us affecting you? They come up with different, um, different explanations of how it is impacting them. First thing is that we see this schism happening between engineering and security, where a vulnerability is generated. Um, it's as action to a developer. Developer pushes back on it. And then they go back, the same thing about being a cat and not being a cat. And then at the end, we find, okay, it's not a cat. And then the mistrust starts to build. And yesterday we spoke at the Expo Center on this same thing and we called it the domino effect of false positives. It starts out with good intentions. At Amazon we say that good intentions um, 
get okay, but they don't always translate to the best results. It's good mechanisms that do. So while the teams have the intention of being very strict in their enforcement, once this mistrust is built because you've issued one, or, you've blocked a pipeline for a major launch two or three times because of a false positive, what end up, ends up happening is that the teams come together, security and engineering, and they say, you know what, let's stop blocking the pipelines. Let's be a bit more nuanced about it. Maybe let's just escalate, send to an escalation in um, distribution. And then we sit and discuss if we should. Let, let's keep the pipeline. We don't want to sacrifice agility for security. It's kind of like a balancing act. And then agility, we don't want agility to suffer. And then we compromise on security. So when that happens, right, you see the teams now compromising on their security enforcement to, be, to, remain, to maintain their agility, right? And then in cases where they have decided to continue with that, you start to see a reduction in engineering efficiency because pipelines are being halted, teams are having, being assigned tickets to go work on when they find out that they, they spend half of the time and they see that it's not actually a vulnerability. And then, of course, the, the third one there, which we already talked about, increased likelihood to bypass security guardrails, right? And this is not, we're not talking about engineers bypassing, we're talking about organizations sitting down and saying, the last two times we blocked pipelines, one, 50% of the time, you know, we see that this, why don't we just, for now, for now it, it, temporarily, let's, let's just finish this launch, and then it becomes a standard going forward. That happens all the time. And then when, when that happens, it leads to a situation that we explained at the beginning of the slide, where I showed you different stages of enforcement, but still having vulnerabilities in production. That is exactly how teams go full circle from having all the checks in place and then somehow still having vulnerabilities in production. It is, this is a domino effect of false positive. And we took all this feedback back to the lab, you know, sat down and really, really got working and came up with a solution that we announced yesterday. And there's no better person here to announce, uh, to walk you through this solution. I've, I've spent my time trying to set the context on the problem and how we approached it. And I'm going to hand over to our engineering manager now, Jas Jabra, to walk us through the solution that we've built to tackle this perennial, um, you know, persisting problem of false positives. Um, please welcome Jas to the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ifine. So Ifine set up the problem space. So let me just talk about the Code Guru security. Uh, this was announced yesterday in the keynote. There's a new product that helps solve all the challenges that Define uh, brought up. So the unique thing about this product is it's a combination of AI and ML, and it brings in very low false positive rate. And why does it? Be, how, do, how do we bring in very low false positive rate into the picture? So we made sure to do a couple of things. One is we took advantage of the vast amount of code being developed within AWS and Amazon and vast amount of developers and security engineers that we have. So anytime we add new detections or new uh, engines for, for detecting vulnerabilities in security aspects, we make sure that each one of them is well tested with every single with, with a large number of developers and security engineers in Amazon. We get the feedback, we uh, measure the acceptance rate and many other metrics to make sure that what we are going to push out in production actually meets our promise of low false positive rate. Second is that we have a very big chunk of security engineers who are also themselves developing rules for detecting security issues within the code base. And many of those rules we then end up adopting. Because what happens is when our security engineers develop their rules, first of all, they are at the very cutting edge of security. So they know about what's upcoming, what kind of things to worry about. Second is they are very, very familiar with all the AWS uh, best practices in terms of APIs, SDKs, et cetera. So they make sure everybody inside our company themselves is also following those best practices. And third, they themselves do a very deep testing because they don't want to bother developers with unnecessary false positives. So that's why we, we adopt many of the rules that apply to public usage of AWS SDKs and AWS APIs from our security engineers. So that's the other reason we uh, other way we meet kind of our low uh, promise of low false positive rate. Third is a combination of program analysis and ML techniques are utilized to make sure that false positive rate is very low. We may sometimes do pure program analysis, we may sometimes do program analysis followed by machine learning uh, in some complex detections to make sure that false positives are pre-filtered out so that you don't get to see them, there is no, no noise generated. And the second aspect that we introduced with CodeGuru Security is a fully, of course, cloud-based, API-based design with very, very easy integration into multiple different uh, CSED tools and IDEs, et cetera. And I'm gonna show some demos later to kind of show how that works. 
And of course, with cloud, uh, you also get the benefit of scalability. So if you are, you are a large company with, let's say, hundreds of thousands or millions of repositories, you can run through them very, very quickly if you, let's say, want to scan all of them at, at any given time. And the third very important feature that we developed based on a lot of feedback from security engineers is bug tracking. So one thing we kept on hearing from security engineers is, hey, it, it takes me a lot of time to track down when a bug has actually been closed. I'll open a ticket and then I'll chase down the developer and ask, hey, is this closed? And the developer will then some point uh, put a comment on the ticket or resolve it saying, yep, it's closed. But I still have to, there is no automated way for me to really figure that out. So we have developed ML-based algorithms to really figure out when a code bug is closed. And it's not as easy as it may sound because as you can imagine between revision one of the code and revision two of the code, the code moves. So the bug that I found at line number 25 may still exist and may have moved to line number 50 in a different method. So we need to match and make sure that we are not gonna call that bug closed. It's just moved, so it's still open. So we have developed algorithms, ML-based algorithms, to track bugs and automatically detect when the code has been fixed. And uh, my colleague Ifain also talked about a lot of different challenges that we heard from our customers and security engineers. And uh, we have tried to solve them uh, in CodeGuru security. So for example, the rollout is very, very easy because it's cloud-based APIs. We have plugins and IDEs. We have integrations in many popular tools like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, etc. cetera. Uh, triaging and prioritization is very easy here because A, we have very low false positive rate. That's one of the big things. But also we give a lot of context with the remediations we give. We have a website we call detector library website where every single remediation we detect you can, uh, there is a link to that website to a particular rule where we have very detailed uh, information on how to fix the rule, examples, etc. And also, of course, when you have fewer false positives, you have to open less tickets. It's faster to remediate those things. And I already talked about bug tracking, tracking and how it helps security engineers really save time in tracking when an issue has actually been closed versus when it's still open. And we really, uh, so one of the things we really strive to work hard at was to make sure that our tool is very, very fast. And the reason is because we heard from our customers that when they integrate into CICD pipelines, they don't want to wait for an hour or even 10 minutes or whatever for the pipeline to finish its scan and then go through. So we strive to uh, make sure that our scans finish within like single digit, low single digit minutes most of the time. So you can uh, add it into your pipeline and, and get the results really, really fast. And of course, because we keep low false positive rate, most of the time you shouldn't have to block your pipeline because of the, you know, uh, because we ensure that you only need to block the pipeline on really, really critical issues. Now let me switch to integrations. So developer lifecycle starts at, of course, the IDE and ends all the way into production. When you're developing something, you're gonna commit, deploy, build, etc. So CodeGuru, because CodeGuru security is API-based with plugins, we can integrate into pretty much any part of this developer lifecycle. So for IDEs, we have integrations into Jupyter Notebooks, Visual Studio, IntelliJ, and more integrations coming soon. Uh, for, uh, for build, pipelines, we have integration into GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, Code Pipeline. And also, one unique thing we are bring, we have brought in this time, which we launched yesterday as GA, is integration into Inspector. So that's very unique because this is the last stage of the uh, developer lifecycle, which is production. So we can actually take the Lambda that's been pushed onto production, get that code, extract out the code from the Lambda and scan it and give you a production view of the reality, which many of uh, many many times our, our security engineers told us that they struggle to get that part of it. Because when you push the code into production, many times it's not even being touched. So you're not pushing any new piece of code, so it's not getting scanned. So the code is sitting there in production in a Lambda, and we don't know if there is a vulnerability sitting there or not. So being able to scan code in, in production is a very, very powerful thing because that gives you exact view of what's exactly the, the vulnerability sitting in lambdas in production. 
I talked about ID integration. So we're, for ID integration, as I mentioned, we have Code Whisperer. So Code Whisperer has plugins through AWS Toolkit, which also include uh, Code Guru security scanning. You can use it in Visual Studio. You can use it in uh, uh, IntelliJ. And of course, we have plugins for Jupyter. And you can also use that in SageMaker Notebooks. We have some unique ML detectors that uh, in the Jupyter Notebook uh, plugin where it also we also detect certain special uh, certain types of errors that are typical developer uh, machine learning developer might end up making then of course i talked about the pipeline integrations uh, in the pipeline integration the way it works is let's say a code is committed to the main line it starts the build process and at that time we get a notification we get the code we scan it and you can then choose to either block the pipeline or uh, basically just monitor the bugs in the pipeline. And I already talked about the inspector integration where you can scan things in production, where whenever you update a Lambda, we'll automatically get a notification and we'll scan the Lambda code for any issues and essentially tell you about what's the production view of reality for security posture. Now I'm gonna switch to the, oh yeah, sorry, one more slide. So, we currently cover Java, Python, and JavaScript, and more languages are coming pretty soon. The other aspect uh, I would like to highlight is that we also cover the top OS top 10, CW top 25, and lot more. Let me switch to demo. All right, I'm gonna move over here. So as I was mentioning, we have many integrations into different pipeline systems. So we have integration into GitHub, where with that integration, when you uh, submit code, we scan it when it's submitted to the main line, and we publish the recommendations on the security tab itself. You can choose to block the uh, pipeline uh, at, if any critical issues are found or high issues are found, you have a full control over that integration, and you can also, of course, can choose to only monitor it. Similar integrations are available for Bitbucket Pipelines, GitLab, AWS Pi Code Pipeline, and we also have a client application, so basically a command line client, which you can use to integrate in any other tools for which uh, uh, we don't have plugin or in instructions available yet, but of course, we are adding more integrations like Jenkins, et cetera, pretty soon. And I already talked about IDE integrations and notebook integrations and inspector. So let me move on to the dashboard. So this is this dashboard shows, shows my test account where I've integrated CodeGuru security into about 20, 30 pipelines. And this gives you a high level view of what's happening across those pipelines. So as a security engineer or a security exec, it gives a very nice view of security posture of various pipelines in one place. So you can at a glance tell how many open findings are there, what are the critical findings, and what's the distribution, what are my top five vulnerabilities that I'm seeing across my pipelines. But the most interesting feature is here. So as I was talking about earlier, we have a bug tracking algorithm, which basically uses machine learning to figure out when a uh, issue has actually been closed, even when it's moving across uh, across methods or across uh, lines. And using that feature, we have we are able to give you statistics like when a bug is open, when a bug is closed, the closure rate, that gives really good insights. What we found is people who use this find insights about, hey, are these pipelines actually getting worse? Are, are the developers actually fixing things? Or are they just letting them leave open? Or maybe there is a regression here where uh, the average time to close of bugs is increasing, so they can dive deep, and you can dive deep and then understand where the issue is and then help the developers or, or, or encourage the developers to then fix. Let me switch to this one, yeah. So one other uh, one I wanted to show was, we have a pretty unique feature of also providing code fixes, not just bugs. So that's only available for a subset of detectors right now, but we are slowly adding it for all the rules. So in this example, this is how a, a single uh, bug or a vulnerability looks like. If you go at the bottom, you'll see this uh, left-hand side is the actual vulnerability, right-hand side at the bottom is the fix, and that fix is available in a patch format. So essentially what it's doing is, we don't just tell you, hey, here is an issue. 
we tell you here are the exact here is the exact lines of code then you can apply to your uh, to your file and fix it you can download the patch and just essentially run the patch command against your, against your file and it fixes the security issue so this is something that we heard again and again from security engineers that they have to work with developers many times to kind of help them understand how to fix the bug and that training process that telling them how to fix the bug working with them to fix the bug just takes up a lot of time we want to be we wanted to be able to get to a point where security engineer can just say here is the patch file just apply it and you're done and that's uh, so that's why we introduced this feature and at, this is this has been a very powerful feature because whenever we have internally tested any bug where we had the code fix which as i said is only available for a subset right now we are adding the bug fix rate which we measure internally increased by 5x so if a typically a bug was being fixed let's say 3 out of 10 times in a month it suddenly went up to like 7 8 9 times a month out of 10 times a month so it it went up like 4 or 5x think i'm all right oops let me switch to the ppt okay i'll now switch to my colleague here uh, omar who's going to talk about the science behind this whole magic that we have omar. hey folks really excited to be here on stage um i hope you got a lot of uh curiosity building out of the uh description so far of the features that we're making available I want to tell you a little bit about how the sausage is made and, and dive into some details on the science behind this product. Um, I wish we could uh, get your questions live, but I'll be around here. So feel free to approach me for questions or uh, thoughts that you have. I'm going to start with something that I'm guessing uh, uh, affected a lot of you, Log4j. Uh, just as an illustration of our detection stack and the types of capabilities that we're bringing into the product. Um, so this came, uh, this came as a huge, uh, uh, as a huge impact uh, that touches a lot of code bases around uh, uh, pretty much the entire industry. And in responding to this uh, incident, uh, we really got an opportunity to expose the full power of our and depth of our detection technologies. And what it means in particular is building a detector that finds instances where untrusted data reaches log. Uh, logging statements in the code, but doing so, and I, I want to bring in a, um, an aspect that Efine already called out and will kind of be um, a repeated theme across my description, which is context. Uh, you want to find these vulnerabilities, but you also want to uh, maintain a very high uh, level of precision. So to do so, you want to, for example, distinguish between the compliant and non-compliant examples presented on this slide where the key difference between them is that in one case, untrusted data flows directly into the logging statement, whereas in the other case, action has been taken to sanitize the input before it reaches the logging uh, operation. And so, really, this would be a false positive. But there's other aspects that are maybe not obvious from this slide that I want to talk about. For example, our detectors are able to pull in context from configuration files. So perhaps you haven't applied sanitization in code, but you have applied sanitization um, through uh, upgrading to a, an appropriate version of the Log4j library. That too is accounted for. And what exactly do you have in your configuration for Log4j? Do you have the right formatting? That also is accounted for. And so really what we attempt to do, and I'll illustrate this again in coming slides, is to bring, to pull in more and more context. So all these pushback modes or all these imprecision modes are mitigated through automation and not through deliberation between humans, which is really what slows you down, causes churn and causes loss of trust between developers and security organizations. Um, so we'll go back to this soon again. But um, meanwhile, I want to emphasize another thing that we're taking uh, a big advantage of, which is ourselves being AW native to AWS. And what that means in particular is that there's a lot of domain knowledge that touches on security, that touches on efficiency, that touches on compliance, on crypto standards that we can really incorporate into our analysis, in particular for surfaces that directly interface with um, AWS as a cloud. Uh, so for example, here what you'll see is an important distinction that is extremely easy to miss in human review of the code 
or if you don't uh, bring this expertise into your analysis tool, which is the subtle uh, difference between re-encrypting, decrypting, and then re-encrypting on the client side, uh, which is both inefficient and exposes you to a potential leak, uh, versus re-encryption done on the server side. Again, it's a very nuanced distinction, but very important um, in the context of you know, leakages that can happen uh, from your client code. So these are essentially, um, we're talking 200 plus services, many thousands of API endpoints, uh, and we have coverage of pretty much all of the risks that you can find within those API sets. Um, so back to context for a second. Um, if you look at the code on the left, the code that's labeled as insecure, uh, you'll see on line six of that program, use of MD5. Now, MD5 is frowned upon. Uh, it's a hashing algorithm that uses a small number of bits, 128 bits, uh, uh, prone to collisions. Um, and as a security person, you, or as a security tool, you may take a defensive approach, seeing use of MD5 in the code and rejecting that, which is exactly an area of friction with developers, right? Uh, seeing MD5, MD5 in and of itself is not problematic. Uh, there could be use cases like bucketing or clustering data, naming data objects, and all sorts of things that have really nothing to do with security. And so if you take a defensive stance, you're going to go into unnecessary battles and you're not actually improving your security posture by fighting this fight. You want to fight the good fight, which is we're using MD5 in a cryptographically sensitive context. And that certainly can happen if you look at the code on the right. So what's interesting about the code on the right is that it pulls in the, the code that we see on the left. And specifically, if you look at line 20, um, where we uh, use this pseudo-random number generator, this is re really where the problem starts to arise, right? Because if you follow the flow of this code, you'll notice that on line 23, a cipher object is being built, making use of the information that ultimately comes from that MD5 call. So keeping track of where that MD5 call uh, flows into and how it manifests in a cryptographic context gives you twofold value. First of all, there is good justification to complain about the, the security of this code in particular. And second, you can really point to the actual place that requires reconsideration, not to the MD5 uh, helper library itself, which in and of itself is not the source of the issue. But doing so requires tracking flow of information across the code base. Um, there's instances where that is maybe um, uh, not so difficult, for example, if it's all local information. There's more interesting instances like this example where things may happen in different functions, possibly different files. And you can even take it to the next step of asking, but what happens if this happens in my ID? I don't even have a full application being uh, available for analysis. I don't have all these dependencies available that I can compile the code and run a scan on it. So the good news is we make no such requirements. Unlike many other scenarios and tools that do require, that do make these assumptions, the way that we have structured CodeGuru security is with a shift left philosophy of being able to perform these forms of semantic analysis without requiring the code to even be buildable. Um, and this is a feature that would allow us, for example, with the limited context available here to uncover a vulnerability and pinpoint the exact line where that becomes a problem with uh, cryptography being used. Um, there's another feature that's been talked about earlier, and I want to add some color uh, to the uh, bug fix tracking or the bug tracking functionality. So um, as you work on code, there's not a single snapshot that really is the thing that you want to scan. What you want is you want this iterative process where you gain, uh, where you gain understand insight into the security posture um, of your systems across revisions what has been mitigated, what has been introduced, and so on. This is a fundamental capability because it gives you invaluable intelligence. You can really ask questions like, over time, have I, am I seeing a growth in my 
uh, in falling out of crypto compliance? Am I seeing growth in hard-coded secrets? And I'm seeing, am I seeing improvement in my mitigation of injection attacks? You can really track the trends. You can do that at the level of a single code base. You can do that at the level of a Lambda function, or you could do that, that across uh, a whole pipeline or a set of pipelines. This intelligence really gives you something to work with and decide your, your risk factors, your prioritization on what to engage. But as my colleague Jazz pointed out earlier, that's not an easy problem. Um, if you look at the code on the left, and specifically on the comment at the top that says line seven and gives you the file location for this, uh, you'll see that this is code that this is code that's under a package that contains activity in its name. Compare that with the box on the right. Now we're talking about line 56 in the code. And even more interestingly, the code has completely been migrated into a, a different place in the source tree. Now the package has adapter in its name. So if you look at the source tree, this code has been moved completely, which often happens. You can refactor code. You can pull something into a library. You can pull something out of a library into the client. You can move things as you grow your code, refactor your code. Um, so okay, that makes sense. We need to track it across different places in the source tree. But this is not where the challenge ends. You'll see if you look just at the syntax for the examples on the left and on the right, the syntax has also changed. And it, it changed in a very important way. Specifically, if you look at line 14, lines 14 and 15, you'll notice that an input stream resource is being allocated. It's not obvious from the code that this resource is ever closed, let alone if an exception is being thrown, which fast forwards you to line 25 with exception handling where the resource is not closed. So it's a bit of a subtlety. Um, it's the resource leak detector that Code Guru Security runs that allows us to find instances like this, and that requires fairly sophisticated data flow analysis to figure out all possible paths along which a resource may be left open. Obviously, with risks like denial of service, what happens if I pile up a lot of resources and don't handle them? What happens to my code then? So there's those risks that you need to handle. If you look at the code on the right, it's not syntactically compatible with the code on the left. It's not a simple copy-paste. What you'll see at line, 60, uh, at line 62 is a try with resources statement, which is a construct introduced in a later version of Java that allows us to automatically close resources like that input stream. The problem has effectively gone away. In that process, we change the file, we change the line number, and we change the syntax. And so bug fix tracking or bug tracking is that capability that allows us to essentially look at different versions of the code and put them along, alongside each other as a bipartite graph where we essentially match between bugs that were only, a only uh, present in the before version versus only present in the after version, versus present in both versions, where we want to allow fuzzy matching to say, yes, there are, different, there are differences between these two versions, and yet I choose to consider this to be the same bug. So there's a lot of tuning and a lot of uh, uh, fuzzy reasoning that goes into this capability, but it's battle tested across multiple Amazon organizations, security teams in Amazon, and Amazon developers. Um, and we have high confidence that it's going to uh, give you very precise intelligence on the status of your open bugs at any given point. Um, there's another capability that I want to pause on. Um, so some of you uh, uh, may ask, uh, you know, Code Guru security, it detects vulnerabilities, but what exactly is the surface that we're targeting? So there is software compositional analysis that gives you a good idea of your vulnerable dependencies, ones that have open CVEs against them, and you want to address that by upgrading to a different library version. But there's a much more actionable surface for your dev teams, which is the bugs or the security threats that they introduce into the code. Now, being able to trigger action on behalf of developers begins with them taking ownership over the code that is vulnerable. And obviously, if what you end up flagging to your developers is a bug in some JavaScript framework, or in some Python library, or in some Java dependency, you'll get immediate pushback. This is not code that we wrote. We're not going to fix it. And in fact, it's probably a good idea in almost all, all cases not to fix it. 
because these are things that are maintained by the open source community, by your supply chain. So you don't want to fix them. What you really do want to put a lot of focus on and where we as a SaaS tool want to spend a lot of our analysis budget is on things that are within your organization's control to mitigate. And I'll state it maybe even uh, more aggressively, if you don't fix them, no one will because these are uh, pieces of code that you wrote. And so we have developed a fairly elaborate machine learning algorithm to be able to classify the code artifacts that you pass into our analysis as either library dependencies or code or application code coming from your organization. And that involves training and feature extraction from hundreds of thousands of different open source libraries alongside other algorithmic techniques that allow us, even at the resolution of a single JavaScript file, to disentangle the lines of code in that file and say, this is a particular line in this file that comes from a dependency versus this is a line that the developer actually wrote. And this is a really important factor in building trust with developers. Whatever we flag is something that we really intend for the organization to fix versus treat as a dependency that needs to be upgraded. Um, I'm going to pause here and switch back to eFine to give you some uh, instructions on how you can get started with the hope that uh, these features have made you curious uh, to, um, to take uh, CodeGuru Security out for a ride. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Jas. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, let me get the clicker. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was just processing how 80% of us gave cat i've never got that kind of spread before it's always kind of 60 40 50 50 so it seems like everyone here has a kind of analytical background which is good um kind of surprising um that'll be a first for me but yeah this is what we have for you today we hope you're really excited to go try this out um you just have to go um you know you want to scan your anywhere before production just go to code guru right uh, we have an integration with Amazon Inspector that is actually at the production. So you've got Lambdas running production. So your, your Lambdas that you already have in production today, you can just enable Inspector code scanning and CodeGuru actually kicks in and takes over scanning that right now. So if you're trying to scan your Lambdas that are already in production and we do um, this with customers and we, we actually are surprised at what we find in production. So that's one way to actually try it out to see. Um, it's kind of like an audit, a very quick audit. Like you, in, in, a, in a snap, you see what you have running in production. It's the fastest way to actually see a kind of a snapshot of a production environment on Lambdas, right? And that gives you a kind of a foretaste of what you're going to see when you integrate it earlier in your CIDT pipeline from CodeGuru itself today. So get, getting started is very simple. You can either go to CodeGuru today and just sign up um, when preview, enable the service, integrate your pipeline, and, and get started today. Or just enable it in Inspector right away to, to quickly see what you have um, in your production environment. Um, thank you, everyone. This was a very good um, um, experience sharing this with you, um, getting your feedback, um, and um, kind of understanding how you look at things in terms of like the cat thing. And, um, Hopefully, we'll be connecting and we'll be seeing you using this service and actually improving your organization's um, security posture regarding code scanning. Um, please fill the survey, and um, we're looking forward to seeing you try this out and give us feedback.